that we have a very eminent scholar in, uh, uh, in medical ethics. His contribution is well above the board. He has been sitting uh, several uh, issue, uh, several sessions on medical ethics uh, over the last uh, maybe three decades and written several books uh, on medical ethics. And he has a several um, research article in his account written by him or is a co-author uh, on medical. Uh, Dr. Uh, Abul Fadal uh, Mohsen Ibrahim is our brother, is sheikh, is mentor from South Africa. And fortunately, he is a graduate of Karachi as well. And he knows a little bit of Urdu, I, I believe. And if you get some questions in Urdu, inshallah, I will be able to, uh, to answer your questions in Urdu as well. Very well versed with the ethical issues related to medical sciences. Has, uh, uh, has been facilitating several workshops in FEMA as well as uh, he is an editor of FEMA yearbook which is very familiar in Pakistan, very famous and uh, uh, all over the world. My yearbook is, his, contrib his contribution is enormous, colossal, and available uh, the, uh, all other contributors as well. So uh, today, inshallah, he will be uh, with us for the next one hour. He will be speaking on a very important issues are related to medical uh, ethics. And we uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Sheikh, for uh, sparing some time from with your very, very valuable and valuable time from very busy schedules. I know you are very busy uh, every now and then. And uh, we are privileged that we have invited in our FEMA conference which inshallah will be held in here. We'll make some arrangement, inshallah, uh, to conduct a session on medical professional ethics in this uh, conference as well. So, with this, I will request Abdul Fadal Mohsen Ibrahim Saab. He's, he's our sheikh, our mentor, and our, uh, uh, our teacher. We will request him to speak on the topic, please. Thank you. Dr. Abdul Fadil Mohsen. Okay, so I'll put the, uh, I'll just use the mic only, and I, I want to share my PowerPoint. Okay, I was a Bilaim Nashaitan, Rijim, Bismillah, Rahman Rahim, Nahmadu, and Sali Allah, Sulay Al Karim, Waba. So today, we, uh, the topic that has been given to me is uh, obligations of the Muslim doctor. And I hope we have uh, enough time for questions also, inshallah. First, let me uh, thank both uh, Dr. Mohammed Iqbal and Dr. Uh, Mohammed, uh, the, pediatric, the one who organized everything, and hope, inshallah, it will be a fruitful um, sharing of knowledge inshallah so when we so the topic that we have is obligation of the muslim doctor and this when we talk about this when we talk about all these things that have to do uh, on the basis of ethics then uh, what what we, what has in my opinion in my personal opinion is that all that falls into what is known as islamic medical jurisprudence but unfortunately the Muslim scholars all over the world, they still um, bend on 
grouping all these you know, ethical issues under what is known as Islamic bioethics. Now, my personal opinion is that it's, uh, it should be under Islamic medical jurisprudence. Now, why is because when we talk about bioethics, then bioethics, it, uh, actually what is right and what is wrong. But as far as the, when you call it, when you, if you call it Islamic medical jurisprudence, then we find that everything that has to do in the medical field, you know, everything, even all the procedures that are done, even if you do abortion or euthanasia and so on, then it has legal implications, you know, it, uh, whether what we are doing is right in the eyes of Allah or not right in the eyes of Allah. So we will be punished for it in the Akhirah, or we will be have the, you know, we will have the blessings of having done that. So that is why I prefer to use the term Islamic medical jurisprudence. Now, as far as uh, uh, the discipline of bioethics is concerned, the, it was only in the middle of the 20th century that we actually started using the term Islamic bioethics. But I remember that when I was doing my doctoral thesis uh, at Temple University in USA, even then it was, uh, the, the term bioethics was not actually, it was in the 1980s. It was not yet uh, fully developed. You know, they were talking about it so, uh, but it, it became a full discipline, you know, during that latter part of the 20th century. So before that, we, we can, uh, before all, the, all that happened, it was known as medical ethics and that we have give uh, uh, with the introduction of uh, the Hippocratic Oath in 500 B, BCE. And this oath is still being revealed by physicians, you know, and all that is that is um, mentioned in that oath, you know, we still, until today, all of you that are going to be doctors and are doctors, they try to uphold it. So now uh, we set the scene of what we're going to discuss today. So the provision of healthcare in the light of Islamic teachings is co considered to be falkifaya. And you all know because you are uh, all Muslims, you know what is falkifaya. And it is, uh, it is important that the community, that we as Muslims be able to provide healthcare to everyone. So that is why we always say that even our female, um, our female, uh, should be educated in the medical field, you know, because then they have a duty towards, uh, towards um, actually attending to the female patients. And we'll talk about that later on, inshallah. Uh, the task of endeavoring to preserve the health is to alleviate the suffering is a privilege, you know, it's a great privilege for, for you who are going to become doctors and for all those who have become doctors. So, but the question that we ask ourselves and that you, as young doctors that has not yet been qualified is what is the difference between you and your non-Muslim colleague? That is the question that we, we have to ask, you know, is what is the difference between the two? So a medical doctor in general, just a plain medical doctor, then he's well qualified in the field of medicine and also uh, he, he has the he or she has the acumen of healing but a muslim doctor you know we are bound by you know by our deen that is the, the directives from our deen that is important that we are bound by it and um, in fact the muslim doctor is expected to leave his or her islam by upholding the teachings and is expected to behave differently on some occasions and to meet greater responsibilities compared to other non-Muslim doctors. So this is the difference. So when we're setting the scene, then we, we have to bring that forth, that this is uh, how it is, that there's a difference between a Muslim doctor and a non-Muslim doctor. 
So now, what are the Quranic imperatives and also imperatives from the Hadith as far as uh, moral morality is concerned? So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in Surah Al Nahl, "Surely Allah enjoys justice, kindness, and doing of good to kith and kin, and forbids all that is shameful, evil, and oppressive. He exhorts you so that you may be mindful." And in the Hadith, we come to uh, called one Hadith. We say the believers whose faith is most perfect are those who have the best character. So character for of a Muslim is very important. Whether he's a doctor or he's not a doctor, it's important that he must be, you know, uh, have a, be upright in every way, an upright personality. So now the ethical traits. Now the first ethical trait that we should have as Muslim doctors is the question of uh, being a muttaqi. And being a muttaqi means that we have to be conscious of the presence of Allah at all times. And, uh, and when, but after having internalized the consciousness of Allah's presence at all times, then we must also acknowledge the fact that he is the ultimate healer. Is the ultimate healer, and then we find that, you know, in the in, the, in Surah Shu'ara, when Sayyidina Ibrahim says, "And when I am ill, he cures me." So he, again, uh, you we we uh, you all your, of you as doctors, you're going to Allah is using you. You are the instruments of healing, but the real healer is Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So then, the Muslim doctor must make his iman faith the backbone of his healing career. Now, the question, uh, the other ethical trait is that he should be humble, you know, uh, but and the Quran says, but those who believe and work righteously and humble themselves before their Lord, they will be companions of the garden to dwell there and forever. In the Hadith of Prophet Islam, it says, pride means to renounce the truth and abase people. So Imam Shafi said, people cannot dispense with two groups of individuals, the scholars for their, for their people's religion and the physicians for their people's bodies. So we have the ulama and also the, the doctors. So we are, they are indispensable in every Muslim society. Since the physician is committed to the task of preserving human life, he is honored and respected and that is why it is so important for him to be humble at all times. He or she should never lose sight of the fact that it is through Allah's grace that he or she has been endowed with the medical knowledge and acumen. So we, we owe everything that you, our knowledge is, own, is owed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we mustn't be like Karun in the Quran tells us that he say, oh, everything he knew, the knowledge he sees, you know, he never acknowledged the, he never acknowledged that it was Allah who bestowed the knowledge to him. The next ethical trait is to be sincere. Allah says, but the sincere servants of Allah for them is a sustenance determined. In the Hadith we have, whoso causes others to hear of his virtues, Allah will grace him thereby. The Muslim doctor is generally trusted and the patient as, all, as well as the relatives and even the Muslim community confide in him or her. He or she must therefore be sincere in the patient's treatment regime and in his counseling of the patient. So sincerity is important. It is important for us to be sincere in whatever we do in discharging our duties as Muslim doctors. Now, the next eth ethical trait is honesty, and this is amana. In describing the believers, Almighty Allah says, they are those who faithfully observe their trust and their covenants. In the hadith, when honesty is lost, then wait for the hour. It was asked, how will Honesty be lost, O oh, Messenger of Allah. He said, when authority is given to those who do not deserve it, then wait for the hour. 
So therefore, the Muslim doctor is entrusted with the privacy of others. Therefore, keeping patients' information in confidence is a sign of honesty. And the next trait, ethical trait, is the question of truthfulness. Sid, uh, oh, you believe, be fearful of Allah and be among the truthful. And the hadith we learn, you must be truthful, very truthfulness leads to righteousness and righteousness leads to paradise. So the physician must be truthful when he speaks, writes or testifies on any issue. He or she should guard against kinship or friendship ties or inclinations of greed or fear that may tempt him or to give a testimony, report or speech that he or she knows is contrary to the truth. And another important uh, marker is that must be punctual for his, his or her appointments and must always keep promises. Whatever the doctor promise he makes, if he tells the patient that I will see you or I'll come home and visit you, then he must keep the promise. You know, he mustn't... Uh, Sorry about that. Now, the next ethical trait is compassion, uh, sympathy or empathy. So very the Allah is kind. Allah is kind. Sorry. The... This will be it, sorry. Yeah, okay, I saw that. So compassion, uh, very Allah is kind and merciful to people. And the hadith says the one who does not show compassion will not be shown mercy. So the physician should be sympathetic towards his or her patients display gentleness with the patients, be courteous and kind to the patients. So these are some of the traits that we, we, we should have as doctors. And then another one is patience and tolerance, sabr. Allah says, indeed, Allah is with the patient. In the, in the hadith, we, say, we see, may Allah, may Allah have mercy on a man who is tolerant, and uh, the medical profession is a demanding profession. It entails dealing with people from all walks of life and requires exercising a lot of patience and tolerance. The physician must tolerate patients' manners and must abstain from recipro reciprocating harm by refusing, for example, to treat a patient or diminish his or her, his or her right to be cared for. Now let's come to obligations. The obligations as uh, Muslim physicians. Okay. So uh, the classical Muslim physicians like Abu Bakr Razi and Ibn Sina were also known as Hukama, that is wise people, due to the fact that they were versed in both philosophy and medicine. Yeah. So they were not only versed in, in medicine, but in also in philosophy. Uh, thus, they did not restrict themselves to pathological prognosis of their patients' diseases, but were equally concerned about their spiritual, social, and psychological well-being. But unfortunately, we find today the Muslim doctors do not have the training of how to be able to handle the students' uh, spiritual you know, um, problems that they have or social problems that they have. You know, the life has become so you know, um, like a rat race, that there's no time for us to find extra time for us to deal with the other problems that our patients are actually facing. So now the one of the first obligations, you know, as uh, Muslim doctors, is that we should always continuously, continuously um, update our medical education. And the good thing is that 
you know, I'm sure in Pakistan also it's the same thing that you must have the CME points every year. You must be be able to to have that and attend. So you be uh, you be able to keep your license only if you have actually fulfilled certain CME points, continuous education points uh, throughout the year. Okay. Now seeking of knowledge is considered to be an act of ibadah in Islam, and say the Muhammad Islam is reported to have said the seeking of knowledge is incumbent upon every Muslim, male and female. So that we as Muslims, the daily dua that we make, we say, Rabbi Zindi Ilma, Rabbi Zindi Ilma, oh Allah, advance with knowledge. So doctors are expected to update the knowledge and skills regularly. Besides, Muslim doctors are required to acquaint themselves with basic knowledge of Islamic jurisprudence. And there is where it is important as Muslim doctors for them to also know about the deen, what uh, fiqh Islam, so that they may be in a position to advise the patients on such matters that pertain to tahara, cleanliness, contraception, abortion, organ transplantation, or even to draw up an Islamic will and how to perform salah during illness. So this is, uh, you know, uh, important for for us as Muslims. So when we do, when we have the continuous medical education, we, even our knowledge of Islam should also we must update our knowledge of Islam, and this is very important. So for for patients, Muslim doctors respect for his patients. So we're talking about respect for patients. The Muslim doctor should carefully choose the appropriate words, you know, when talking to the to the patient to the patients. For example, Allah is very clear in the Quran it says, speak good words to the people. It is equally the responsibility of Muslim doctor to be punctual and to structure his or her patient contact schedule efficiently. So this is what we talking about respect for patients. It's a question of we must be responsible, uh, punctual when we give uh, appointments for our patients. And then overbooking, that is a problem even in South Africa here, we have overbooking of patients and that is not acceptable. As Muslim doctors, we must not do that. And, and we must, uh, because it convenience the patient themselves. If they have an appointment to, have to go somewhere else, if you overbook, then everything becomes, you know, haywire. So we're talking about the Muslim doctor should carefully choose the appropriate words. We spoke about that. that must, uh, when when they're speaking to the patient, mustn't overbook. And the rooms within which the medical consultation is conducted should be pleasant and clean at all times. And, and we know about the importance of Tahara. And then also, furthermore, we should have adequate toilet ablution and solar facilities provided to the patients in our rooms. And then we go on to the question problem everywhere in the world is the question of the consultation fees. Of course, then we're not speaking about uh, Muslim doctors who are who are actually in uh, in hospital setting and so on. When but they, when they are private, you know, when they private, the question of of uh, consultation fees today healthcare is considered to be a very lucrative prof profession. And there always exists the possibility of the patient being regarded as a commodity to satisfy the, de the desired end. However, the primary objective of the Muslim doctor should be to attain the pleasure of Allah by providing affordable health care. This goal should not be diluted by monetary gain. Thus, the Muslim doctor should be considerate and assess the financial resources of his patients before issuing a bill for services rendered. Since health is a basic human necessity, patients should not be denied this service, even if they cannot afford it. However, while this does not imply that the patient should not be charged a reasonable fee for services rendered, the Muslim doctor should take cognizance of the fact that over-servicing and over-prescribing and exploitation are not acceptable. The Quran warns us against this, no misappropriate knowingly things entrusted to you. So what happens sometimes when we are in a private uh, practice, then what we do, we over, I mean, uh, 
make the patient go to all sorts of tests, even if they are very old, over 80 years old, then we, we are unnecessarily cause all that. And, and that is something that we should avoid doing. We must just be able to, to, to think about the financial situation of the patient. And unfortunately, when, when, when people are on, when they have uh, medical insurance and so on, some of, of the doctors, then they, they try to do everything so the maximum can come out of there. But I think that is uh, not wise for us as Muslim doctors to do. Now, another uh, issue I want to talk about is the gender sens sensitivity. Now, a medical examination, depending on the nature of the medical problem, could necessitate a female pa Muslim patient to expose her private parts to a male physician in privacy of his room. This would pose two legal problems. One is known as a cashful aura, revealing of one's private parts to someone other than one's spouse, an engagement in halwa, seclusion with a, with a stranger. However, two juridical rules would justify the action of a Muslim patient to resort to being examined by a doctor of the opposite sex on the ground of medical necessity. And one is a darora, so necessity renders the prohibited permissible. And the other one is, should one be compelled to choose between two disadvantageous evils, of for the lesser in order to prevent the greater injury. So the, the lesser uh, of, the, of the, if there is no, if, for example, if there's a female patient, there's only a male doctor, then it would be, it would be permissible for that female patient to be seen by a male doctor because of the greater injury by not having medical attention. So when a female doctor is available, but now when you talk about fiqh and the Islamic jurisprudence, then they, they say that when a female doctor is available for female patients, the two juridical principles which permit a Muslim to be examined by a doctor of the opposite sex would be nullified by another juridical principle, namely whatever action is made permissible for a particular reason is negated once the justification reason for permissibility becomes absent. So, so we're talking about that, but I know there are many Muslim doctors that have female patients. You know, we are in South Africa where, where we, we live in a non-Islamic environment. So perhaps that may be condoned, but I don't know in Pakistan, it might be different that the female patient will, see only, will be seen by only female doctors. I'm not sure about that, but that is the norm that should be. So that's why we must train our, our daughters to become uh, physicians or, or doctors so that they can attend to their, to their own, uh, the patients of the same sex. So then we come to the question of, uh, you know, confidentiality. So now as Muslim doctors, there are many things that we, we see in our practice that we are not supposed to disclose unless we discussing it with another uh, uh, colleague of ours to see to seek a second opinion and so on that's fine but then there are certain exceptions that must be made uh, as far as uh, keeping the the secrets of our patients so the exceptions and that is the ruling that we had uh, in in india by the the fit council in india and this is what they said, the exception. It must be the same thing in Pakistan also. And it, I mean, it's very clear that the exceptions, for example, if the eyesight of a person who is employed as a driver is impaired, mm -hmm. it will be necessary on the part of the doctor to inform the employer of that. Likewise, if a pilot or bus driver is so addicted to alcohol, which may jeopardize the safety of passengers, the doctor is obliged to disclose that information to the concerned department. So we cannot, if we find that this is to save the life of other people, you see, so it's important if there's a problem with the eyesight or if the person, if the pilot is addicted or the bus driver addicted to alcohol, then we must make that known to wherever they're working that they pose a danger to, to the people that are that they're going to service. 
and the other exception is in the event that the doctor is aware of an offensive of an offense having committed by any of her patients and someone else is being prosecuted for that offense and the doctor is required to make that known uh, fact known to prevent an innocent person from being convicted so if you call to you must go forward and actually prevent the the wrong person being con convicted of a crime and the last one that we have there are many more but only one last one that we discuss here if one of the doctor's patients is suffering from a certain disease of sexual deficiency proposes to a woman and the woman or her legal guardian contacts the doctor in the context of impending marriage proposal it is incumbent upon the doctor to state the factual position however if neither the woman nor her legal guardian contacts him in that regard it would not be necessary for him to voluntarily disclose that information to the party concerned so this is uh, it's only when you are called they ask your opinion about that that you do it but then if not then you must not you 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 don't have to disclose that information now you know as muslim doctors you know it is important that we we have we develop a relationship with the with our patient you know and um, we have to prepare the patients for especially those who are dealing with terminally ill patients to prepare them for for death and this is important that we have to pre, uh, actually uh, make them understand uh, that there is that death is a reality you know allah says kullu nafsi daikatul maut that everyone so we when we talk if we know that the patient uh, has a disease which will eventually lead to his death we must be able to to counsel the patient you know counsel the patient the terminally ill patient make him accept you know that eventually all of us have to leave this world you know we, we no one is going to stay here forever so then what happens it is important that the muslim doctor then discusses uh, with the patient you know the everything that has to do after he leaves this world you know all that needs to be done about even writing drawing up an islamic will but perhaps this may not apply in pakistan but in in our country here it applies because we are living in a non muslim country and then issues relating to burial arrangements you know what was it, what used to be done in pakistan may not be a problem at all because it's a muslim country but here is a problem so all that has to be taken care of if they have any message or advice and that is important if the patient confide in us and they have anything to say then we have to um, you know take that message and then convey it to the families and, and and this is important as one of our duties or obligation as a muslim doctor and uh, unfortunately today you know we find that muslim doctors they do not you know go to the extent there are exceptions go to the extent of uh, actually participating in the janaza of their patients of course janaza is a fard kifaya if it is, if you are busy you cannot it's fine but then everyone must make a point as a muslim doctor to visit the family of the dead you know who was our patient before it is important that we do that that we have to um, keep uh, our contact with the family to see if they all right you know after losing someone if we can assist them you know to cope with whatever if they need uh, to be sedated or something like that then we must be there for them and then um, so since the female doctors do not participate in the janaza then the, the the least they can do is to visit the family or the of the dead okay and i think uh, that we're coming to an end uh, and then we'll ask questions inshallah uh, so the conclusion that we come to is that the muslim doctor should always be aware of the fact that allah is the ultimate healer but in our profession you know it is important that when we start 
consulting when we, we we start with the name of Allah, Bismillah. You know, it is important that we do that. And then Huwa Shafi, Allah is the ultimate healer. So we have that at the back of our mind. And this is important to have the conviction because sometimes uh, it will help us to be able to accept that this is so much we can do for the patient. You know, everything else is in the last hand. So we do whatever we can, but eventually Allah is the one who decides whether the, the, the patient's life will be extended or we prolonged or not. So that's why it's important to, for us to know and Muslim doctors, so it actually a form of, it calms us. Even if we have to lose a patient, you know, we'll be able to, to control ourselves because we know that we are only the instruments of healing and the real healer is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as Muslim doctors, we all have to update our medical education. And this is a very important. Things are happening so fast in the, in the world, in the field of medicine today. And it's impossible important for us to keep abreast with what is being done. And then we must never lose sight that the patient is actually the means of our living. So, you know, he's giving, actually, we, we are actually, um, it's so sad that we, uh, we're making money because the patient is sick. So he pays us for treating him, you know? So we must respect him because of that we must respect him not because of that of giving us the money but because he's a human being and he has come to us and he's our patient so we must treat that patient with dignity and i and we must always try also to be able to uh, be present when the last rites of the patients are being performed if we cannot be present then we should be able to visit the family members of the dead who who were our patients. And after saying this, I say, Rahim. And if you have any questions, uh, I'd be pleased to try and answer your questions. Okay, any question? Uh, sir, as you said during your presentation that we must not overcharge our patients. Then, as we uh, nowadays are working in an environment where healthcare has become an industry, and how we can, are there some guidelines or rules which can help us determine that how much should be the charges and how we should determine that what should be charged for the patients? Uh, I didn't get the question exactly. It says the guidelines for what? And as you said in your presentation, that we should not overcharge our patient, that we should not have more fees from the patient and more charges from the patient. Are there some guidelines or rules which can help us to ascertain that how should be the fees and how should be the charges from the patients? Uh, it's very difficult. I can't uh, actually hear. So well, the, the, the question is the question that uh, uh, pertain to the charging of fees to the patient. Yes, the charging of the fees from the patient. But what are the guidelines? Hello? Uh, sir, the question was regarding charging of the fees from the patients. Charging of fees to the patient? Yes, sir. You mean the guidelines for that? The guidelines you you see the problem is uh, is is it do I hear what you're saying? Is the guidelines for charging fees you're asking? Hello. Yes, sir. Guidelines for charging fees from the patients. Is the the guidelines? All right. Now you see the problem is that uh, the first thing we must try and assess the financial um, capability of the of patient, you know, then, so there's no real guidelines per se, but if we can, you know, afford 
to see the patient, but they not charge uh, the consultation fees, then it's fine. But all the other tests that have been done, then if we can get, you see here in South Africa, we have, uh, we can actually get uh, the Zaka money to help to pay for the patient's uh, needs. So I'm sure we'll be able to do that in Pakistan also. So there's no real guidelines, but uh, the guidelines of charging fees, that depends on, uh, you see what happens, we have a medical aid in South Africa. So they have, they, they, these are used as guidelines for what they charge, you know? So, uh, so that's what we follow, but I don't know elsewhere what we can do. Uh, Chef, do you allow me to? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I personally believe that this uh, medical consultation is a mashwara. It is a, it is a consultation. So it is an imana as well. So uh, it is the right of the other Muslims if he asks you some, uh, some consultation, and yeah. you charge that. And it is your obligation to give the mashwara or this consultation. So depending mm -hmm. on the patient's uh, economical and uh, uh, the affordability of the patient, you need to tailor your... Uh, so it is not possible to, with a one yard stay, you can fix your fee for everyone. Uh, that's okay, but you need to uh, make certain concession for those people who are not affording. Uh, exuberant charges uh, are not allowed in um, uh, for the services in Islamist perspective, to my uh, knowledge. Uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he invited a person to do him a coughing and he paid to him in the form of grains. So it is from the Sunnah of Rasulullah to pay the doctors for their services. But at the same time, if someone is unable to pay, so you, you cannot compel him to pay the services which you provide to them. But in these days, uh, there are the medical services have become so costly that not everyone, not everywhere, it is possible to provide free of cost um, services. So uh, I, I think it is the responsibility of the state to provide free of cost services to the people. Uh, but at the same time, um, I, I strongly believe that, that exaggerated charges uh, uh, on, on your services should not be allowed uh, according to Islamic injection. This is my perception of things. I don't know Allah Alam. It's, uh, Allah knows the best. Yeah, no, it's good. Okay. Any other question? Are there more questions? We are the students. I, I, I think if there are no more questions, we will uh, thank our Sheikh uh, Abdul Padil Mohsen Ibrahim for uh, an elaborated talk on this topic. And we thank him and the, all the audience for sparing their time to be with us in after, this afternoon in Pakistan and maybe um, early afternoon in, the, in South Africa. I believe there's a two hour difference. Uh, of time, but uh, uh, we have enlightened by, by your uh, by your very elaborated talk on this topic, and we believe that inshallah uh, it will uh, enrich our uh, in, uh, knowledge on on the ethical issues and the guidelines which you have given us. Inshallah, will be will invite us to provide the, the uh, ethical services to our patients. Uh, one thing which I, I just want to add here is the competencies of a Muslim physician. Um, I, I think these days and age, we are talking about contextual curriculum and contextual 
services which are being provided by our institution. Uh, we need to discuss sometimes later what, what we mean by contextual curriculum and what we mean by contextual services which are being provided to our patients. So uh, th th this, uh, this is one of the competencies which is nowadays is being um, asked by the different uh, medical agencies to be uh, developed among the, the medics as well as uh, among the other healthcare providers that their services should be contextual. And uh, inshallah, uh, we will request uh, Dr. Abdul Fadil Mohsen Ibrahim Saab in future, sometime we talk in the, on this topic, maybe sometime in future, inshallah. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdul Mohsen Ibrahim Saab. And we strongly believe and expect that you will be, inshallah, coming to Pakistan in, in late October. We, uh, there will be FEMA and FEMA conference. The weather will be very, very effective at that time. And uh, we, we believe that the COVID situation at that time will be much better than, we, than now. So, uh, and it's safe to travel to Pakistan nowadays and if you make your, uh, uh, if, you, if you give us a consent, inshallah, we'll send you the, the rest of the things which are required. Okay. Let me invite you once again, sir. You're very, uh, very, uh, uh, very kindly, you, you accorded your consent last time but because of the COVID situation, we uh, actually canceled this. And uh, now it's the COVID situation is much better. And uh, inshallah, we will be holding it uh, physical face to face. This conference in Islamabad, it will be held inshallah on 29th to get the, the large conference. And before this, there will be a FEMA executive body and FEMA council meeting as well, two days prior to this. So I and inshallah in life it happens with your knowledge, with your expertise, as well as your presence in Pakistan. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Shukran, uh, Dr. Iqbal. So, and thank you all for having me and I hope inshallah we'll meet in future. Shukran Jazilan. May Allah bless all your students to qualify as very good Muslim doctors committed, inshallah wa ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa